Coming up next, an interview with an 80s underground band that somehow sold a million copies of their debut album with absolutely no promotion. No radio play, no label support, nothing. The album had several familiar songs that you know, the children of the 80s know by heart. But the album was like contraband. If you had it, you were lucky because it was hard to find. How did this little band that could sell a million albums? Find out next with an exclusive interview with the band. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever rode in the back of a pickup with your friends back in the dangerous times of the 80s, you're going to dig this channel. It's nostalgia all the time. We share music and memories in this community. Make sure to subscribe below right now by clicking the red button and uh, check the box. You always know when we're coming out with new stuff. Violent Femmes. First of all, one of the greatest band names ever. The Femmes were the foremost purveyors of folk punk, originating from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Gordon Gano on guitar and lead vocals, and Brian Ritchie on bass, backing vocals. They were the mainstays with you know, other members going in and out of the band. Though the band has released many albums over the decades, it's their self-titled debut album that started the fire. With 80s classics like today's Focus, Blister in the Sun, Kiss Off, Oh, you can all just kiss off into the air. They always censored Add It Up and Gone Daddy Gone. It made this record infamous. It was really hard to come by. Even though it would sell a million copies, and it did this, again, without any label support or real radio play. It was all through this thing called word of mouth before the word viral was used in our everyday vernacular. True word of mouth, uh, lending and borrowing the cassette or vinyl out to a friend. I mean, I remember first hearing it because I was lucky to get an elder classman to record a copy for me on cassette. I cherished it. I played it really low so that my parents, you know, wouldn't hear it, come take it away. This was a classic 80s contraband album. I mean, you had to earn it. Violent Fans were actually founded by bassist Brian Ritchie and early percussionist Victor DiLorenzo after the end of the first wave of American punk. And then it turned into a full-fledged band when Gordon Gano came into the fold. It was Ritchie who came up with the band's name, though, Violent Fans. It was, of course, a joke, not meant to stick, but it did. And he and DiLorenzo, Ritchie and DiLorenzo, they had this rhythm group uh, before Gano joined, and they used that as the moniker. In the beginning, the Femmes busked uh, in the streets, and they played coffee shops. It was actually a member of the Pretenders that discovered them in the late summer of 1981. James Honeyman Scott, uh, the guitarist, to be exact, he found the band busking on the corner of the street of a venue that the Pretenders happened to be playing that night. And Chrissy Hine and the band asked him to play a short acoustic set before they came on stage that very night. How cool is that? They recorded their debut album, Violent Femmes, in 1982. It was released by uh, Slash Records in the spring of 83. And even though it sold 1 million copies, it actually wouldn't enter the Billboard charts, the album chart, until almost a decade later, on August 3rd, 1991. Now it's sold 3 million copies. It's pretty amazing. Up next, the band, including original member singer-guitarist Gordon Gano and bassist backup vocalist Brian Ritchie, they tell the story of this 80s classic. Now, as we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I wear the glasses that you see me wear every day. I love these things. I mean, you can get a pair for every day of the week. I'm not kidding. Uh, because they're co so cost effective. They're so quality. You're going to be a customer for life, believe me. Simply go to zenny.com and pick out a few pair. See how they look before you buy with Zenny's amazing mirror feature. Check it out. Here's Gordon Gano and Brian Ritchie, and uh, they got the story. We had pretty, trouble in the early great. days. <laughs> trouble getting gigs at the conventional rock clubs in Milwaukee. Uh, I think the main problem was that nobody really thought what we were doing even was rock. Uh, we heard that a lot. So we were playing folk clubs, jazz clubs. We had a residency at a jazz club, but every once in a while we'd make one of these, you know, like in Buddhism, they have the nobility of the feudal gesture of trying to <laughs> get, uh, you know, get a gig. So yeah. we went to this club called Century Hall 
and walked into the office of the talent booker and said, yep, here we are. We've got our instruments with us. We'd like to audition for you. We'd like a gig at your wonderful establishment. Oh, no, 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 guys. Do you have a cassette? Can you give me a cassette? Well, yeah, we have them, but we're, we're here. We'd like to just play for you. Uh, is it just the three of you? Yeah. We'd take nothing less than a quartet. Oh, come on, let us play. And he actually wouldn't listen to us at all. So we, he kicked it, basically kicked us out of the place. And um, <laughs> so we walked about a block or two to the Oriental Theater, which is where we saw on the marquee tonight, the pretenders. So we thought, okay, this is a good place to set up. And we didn't call it busking then. We, did, we had never heard the word right. busking. We didn't know what busking was. We called it playing on the street. Girl, trouble. Yeah. Let's go play on the street. So we were playing on the sidewalk, really. And uh, yeah, as you said, James Honeyman Scott came out. We didn't know who he was, though. We just noticed somebody looking at us. But then when he came out with these other three people who were Chrissy Hind and the other two guys um, from the Pretenders, then we ha had an idea, OK, this, this is the Pretenders. And they were, they were just like listening, and we played. Some people were throwing quarters in our guitar case or whatever. And eventually, uh, Chrissy said, hi, I'm Chris. Would you like to play with us tonight? So that was <laughs> like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we did that. Their tour manager, I think his name was Dave Hill, went out on stage and said, pretenders will be up shortly, but first, Milwaukee's own Violent Femmes. <laughs> and then we came out looking pretty raggedy with our acoustic guitars and snare drum. And yeah, audience was unanimously booing. We got a very harsh reception from the hometown crowd. And we went through three songs. They gave us the opportunity for three songs. And we played that was probably Blister in the Sun, Kiss Off, and Girl Trouble. But by the end of the set, we had won over about half the crowd. So half of wow. them were cheering and half were still booing. <laughs> and to this day, much more than, I mean, there were maybe 3,000 people in the hall and about 300,000 people have told me and Gordon <laughs> that they I were was there. there at the gig. And, and, and the only appropriate response is, yeah, that means you were booing. <laughs> well, because or, they were all which, booing. Which, yeah, what, which yeah, camp were you in? Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody says they were booing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an <laughs> interesting know story. Now if they were. <laughs> and then the next day, the, the promoter was inundated with complaints from local musicians. Why did you put those bums on the stage <laughs> instead of us? And, and, then, uh, and then after that, nothing happened. Yeah. But it gave that, us a nothing. whole lot of, um, <laughs> of confidence in wow. what we were doing. The fact that, that these international artists recognized what we were doing and then we knew it was good but yeah, it was, it was, it was nice to have confirming. an affirmation from somebody yeah. else yeah yeah it wasn't that we were we were very confident in what we were doing absolute confidence that what we were doing was good uh even if absolutely if there was nobody else that would agree with that but then the pretenders did sometimes it's discussed in terms of or put put out is like a discovery right but to me a discovery means that then you were in the movie right. or then you were like <laughs> you know then your career just took it off it is a discovery but like when the vikings of, you know, came to north america and then they looked at it and then they sailed off yeah it makes for a great story later on Exa you know? that's exactly what happened thankfully i'd run into somebody who uh, exchanged numbers with at some kind of poetry thing. And uh, she gave me a call and said that she was forming a band. She was going to shave her head and it was going to be like the plasmatics or something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I can come by and I guess uh, audition for the band or something. And then I thought, well, why don't I write a song, uh, you know, to show up with a song? Ambitious. And I wrote Blister in the Sun. <laughs> and I guess I was gonna, you know, hand it off to her just as she, you know, with the <laughs> that was gonna, and uh, something happened. I don't know if she called or I went somewhere and no one was there or I never even, or I never went. I don't know what, I never saw her again. Uh, never heard from her ever again, as I can recall. And then I thought, oh, I've got this, this I really like this song. 
But that was like the focus. And that, that's just amazing to me. Yeah. That it was like, I'm going to write this song because I'm going somewhere tomorrow. It'd be nice to show up with a fresh song to volunteer, to like yeah. have, be like, I got a song too if you want to do it. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of that in a long time. And now I know there's a, there's a Violent Femmes cover band that, that I get to sit in and play with a lot. <laughs> uh, and I play violin in the, in the group and just do anything I want. <laughs> The person that does my role is a woman who sings and plays and all that. Oh, thinking, wow. I never even thought of that. I have to tell her that Blister in the Sun, I, re I originally wrote that thinking a woman was going to sing the song, uh, but then quickly moved away from that and <laughs> decided, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think this, I'm going to, I'm going to do this one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with that song, it's got a classic part where you start whispering. It's almost like you're lulling the audience to sleep. And then boom. Well, Gross Point Blank being used in Gross Point Blank, you guys re-recorded it because the mastered tapes, right? We had to re-record it because the first album, uh, master tapes were put into a landfill. The recording studio went out of business and then they took out an, an advertisement in like the local newspaper saying anybody who has tapes at, at such and such a recording studio, please retrieve them by this date or they'll be whatever. And we, <laughs> we found out later that they, that they just took all these two inch master tapes of everybody, not only us, but everybody else who didn't see this newspaper ad and put them in a landfill. So, you know, like when, when they reissued the first album, they're like, can you guys do some remixing? And we're like, no, <laughs> we can't do any remixing. The tapes don't exist anymore. I know that John Cusack had a hand in hand picking those songs for Gross Point yeah, Blank. Yeah, and yeah, he, so he, 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 he said hi to us and said how much of a fan he was. And yeah, as I recall, some of the the business side of that really came down to he really insisted on on having that. And part of the thing that's making you so miserable is the angst over killing a lot of people. It's hard to imagine what um, added up the impact of that line you're talking about, or even the name of the band Violent Femmes uh, from the vantage point of today, you know, post rap and after there are other bands like Butthole Surfers. Avalanche coming down the mountain. At that time, that song in particular and also the name of the band was, was quite provocative and, and probably um, held us back in some commercial regards. You know, like we wouldn't get offered gigs or because of simply because of the name of the band. But in the long term, you got to think it worked in our favor. But that was, yeah, more provocative at the time than it could possibly be now. I think one thing about that song that comes to my mind, because you've been asking some questions about, you know, of the origins of beginnings of thought, and I think that one was inspired at least uh, whole sections of it by um, Blondie's Rapture and the and the rapping. Which was my first time of hearing rap was through that song, <laughs> and uh, I think my my kind of chanting the words at a certain point. I really think was probably had some some uh, inspiration and influence there. And then did you the, tell her that when we did those gigs with her last year? No, no, I didn't. <laughs> she would have liked to That's hear that. Oh yeah. yeah. Your eye on your son. I know you've had problems. You're not the only one. Love is gone. Yes, gone. Daddy gone. Love is gone. I don't have any story or any recollection specifically of of when first writing the song. Yeah. I know when we first, pretty early on with playing it, uh, Brian Ritchie had the idea of playing uh, a xylophone type instrument on it. And that happened we, when um, we used to do this thing which you called busking, but we called it playing on the street. Furthermore, we would, uh, with our original drummer, Victor, we would do that and we did it as a form of expression to rehearse and to play and all that. But when we actually wanted to make money, 
it was just me and Gordon because we looked so scruffy. Victor looked respectable, so Is we that did why? more. It was, it was peculiar when it's like just without our drummer and just the two of us, then they, we actually so made something. That was yeah. one Strange. night when I was like, hey, let's go play on the street. And that, but I didn't bring the bass, I brought the xylophone. Gone, gone huh. And I said, yeah, I don't really know how to play this thing very well. Do you have anything that's either in C major or D minor? And then really? Gordon. Really? I totally forgot that. Gordon had I like. I had something. Got to ask you about Kiss Off because as a teenager, I mean, that speaks to those rough days that you have where you come home and you hear that song and you're like, the whole world can just kiss off into the air. Where did that come from? Probably like you described. Yeah, <laughs> there's uh, frustrating times and being in school and not wanting to be there and, and putting that kind of energy into, like you would have it for listening to the song and then learning it and playing it yourself like so many people do it's like yeah. well i was writing it probably with that same kind of i felt energy. the same way but i i manifested it by throwing spitballs at people yeah oh, yeah <laughs> so, so you know you use your time a little more wisely yeah i really am i'm really glad that i decided i'm just gonna you know, close the door and stay in my room and write these songs wow what a good decision that was It really yeah, works absolutely. out. Yeah, so no, I met but Gordon that was... when he was still in high school. Well, yeah. obviously the band started when he was still in high school, but I went over and, he, and, and oh, what do you have? And he goes, oh, here's one I wrote in study hall the other day, and it was like country death song. <laughs> oh, that's pretty good work for study hall. Yeah. <laughs> Is that how you felt when you heard Kiss Off, man? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You need someone to scream <laughs> on the way home from school every day. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, yeah all those different anthems. and. Um, it was nice too. There's humor in it too, which also is an extremely attractive factor. It's not just a you know single faceted thing where you feel like this is just anger. There's like snarkiness and depth to it that pulls you. Yeah, in. that's a great thing. You because know? you actually count your anger out. One, 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 because you left me, and two, two, two for my family. Yeah, two, so right, it's very. Right. <laughs> and then speaking of the humor, um, which I think that yeah, that's I think that's weaves its way through probably more, m most of the songs in different ways. Four, four for my headaches and five, five, five for my loneliness. Uh, but that song in particular, I thought it was very funny in counting and saying what something's for and letting out that anger that um, I decided eight would be that I would forget what eight was for. <laughs> and I wrote it like that yeah. rather than, you know, just I happened to forget it one time and then thought that, no, I, I thought that, that I thought I thought and still think that's kind of funny. Oh, it's hilarious! <laughs> I love it. Building up, getting close to the climax. So I forget what that one nine was for. for but a lost let's get back right nine, and then ten, you know, <laughs> like, ten. and also like I've already had this in my mind of which yeah. I, I forget what that one was for. But yeah, now, I, you know, to me that's funny. I oh, still yeah. think it's funny. <laughs> Make sure to leave us a comment about this amazing band. They are so great. What are your memories of Violent Femmes? Did you have their debut album? You know, what memories are tied to these songs? Let us know in the comments. Let's have a great discussion. Make sure that you subscribe below if you want to be a part of this music community. It's the true spirit of radio. Take a look at our merch and our Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. That's the idea. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.